welcome, welcome to, to Fishing Discoveries. discoveries. <laughs> Third time one looking. Yeah. No, I thought we'd have to throw in a bad one just to sort of show it's not too uh, pre-prepared. Really. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is part three of a three-part series, Making Wet Flies Great Again, I believe. We're sort of working under that yeah, title. Yeah, the modest title. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you missed one and two, um, look around on screen or on the page where you are right now because somewhere we'll probably send a link to that. Give them a watch before you watch this one, I would recommend. Yeah, it's it, just sort of highlighting that, mixing the modern and the vintage and showing yeah. what relevance even to yeah. modern competition anglers some of the stuff that was written in the 18, yeah. 1800s still bang up to date today if you've watched so far um or and you're all caught up you're in for a real treat in this episode paul i'm staring at a table full of all <laughs> kinds of what looks like exotic but is actually quite traditional materials yeah yeah um it's the kind of thing that would look good in a print book and if that sort of thing <laughs> whets your appetite, stick around till the end because we may have a surprise for you. <laughs> so, what? Uh, where are we going in this episode? So, there, I mean, there, obviously, it begs a question: Why the hell have all this crap out on the desk? But um, it really, we left you dangling at the end of last episode with the rediscovery of. Um, I'm sure it wasn't news to him, but uh, <laughs> John Shaner's collection of Roger Woolley's Tide um, set of Cutcliffe flies, mm. um, which is just an astonishing thing. Um, so I just wanted to look a little bit more about what that yeah. means and, and where that sort of to takes re- us. To reiterate, right back to the first episode, these are all stiff, hackled, wet flies for flowing water, river flies, mm. which in most, what we thought in most UK literature and tradition, you don't really see stick, stiff, hackled wets. No, it's fair to say that soft tackles sort of rule the, the roost in yeah. terms of people's knowledge um, yeah. today, at least. Yeah, but boy, were we in for a surprise. Yeah. Well, and, and the fact that that um, that a box of flies, because we, we were struggling, as I said you know, to, in the last episode, to recreate these things just using descriptions. So the fact that this kind of grail was held out where, oh, there's actually a type set of specimens out yeah. there, was that was like you know um, amazing news and boy you know we were sort of sort of hoping um, against hope that this would give us some extra clues and maybe take us a little bit further down the road but my word did that over deliver <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, to, to put people totally in the picture in Cutcliffe's original book yeah that was published at, you know at, at contemporary to himself that even makes sense proper <laughs> English um there were no pictures, no illustrations, so you're left with fly recipes, but you don't really see the picture. Mm. Um, they were interpreted by Roger Woolley in the 1930s. We, we have a, probably, the best window we can narrow it down to is probably 30s to 40s. Mm. It was probably just before he started employing um, some of the helpers that, that he had in with his business yeah. um, as a professional tire. Yeah, so the, the only sort of you know, proper collection, let's say, you yeah. know, sticking to the book yeah. um, that is in existence that we're aware of is Roger Woolley's collection that yeah. was owned by John Shane. And significantly, this would have been taken from the list of 38 specific recipes that appear at the back of Cutcliffe's manuscript. Mm. Now, Cutcliffe himself said he fished with a smaller subset of that, but he wanted to, you know, it's quite a generous sort of um, instinct. He wanted people that visited Devon to feel confident. So he kind of culled all of the best patterns from the Devonshire area that fitted his system. So he was a very, very um, modern, forward-thinking, kind of modular system where things would switch in and out. But the the flies that fitted within that um, mode of use... He listed them in the back of his book, and that and that is what Roger Woolley's customer had ordered up. Um, yeah. We've not been able to find it in in any of uh, Woolley's catalogues because we've had some fantastic help from. I mean, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about this, but we've had some fantastic help from people, particularly people like John Watson, who actually wrote a book um, on Woolley um, and the fact that Woolley, you know, he, he worked in close proximity to um, a tannery, so he had lots of, you know, sources of kinds of material and he had a very good understanding of, of dubbing and of hackles and mm. it was an excellent tyre, particularly given that he only tied with his fingers, didn't use a vice, so yeah. very, very precise sort of flies. F- for instance, you know, we've got um, some a- examples here of ones that are probably, they're definitely tied um, out of Woolley's um, uh, business. They may have been tied by one of his assistants, but he, he was such a stickler for quality control, um, you know, that they would be basically identical to ones that he would tie himself. But the significant thing is, is that uh, they are thought to be of a Devonshire style, so the proportions and the, and the, the recipes for that. So Woolley had a bit of an interest in Devonshire patterns outside of um, this 
seemingly one-off specific order that um, very, very tidy tie as well yeah for, for someone that's actually doing it in the fingers as yeah well. i mean that's phenomenal I'd, you know i struggle to get neater than that with and yeah. bearing in mind that these are you know many many decades old now yeah, um, yeah. you know it's, uh, they've obviously and they may have been stored you know in less than perfect conditions so finding that sort of treasure trove of you know sort of history preserved in mm. woolly's set of flies that john shane owned that was stunning enough but then for John to have a brother who was a pro photographer willing yeah. to photograph the entire collection. <laughs> have macro lens and high tech lighting will yeah. sort of, you know, provide uh, close, hugely magnified detail photos yeah. for the project. <laughs> so we're incredibly fortunate to yeah. have this complete, well, what we hoped would be a complete set. But as well, it's like that, this is where the, the story takes an interesting turn. That's the plot twist. I mean, no sort of good adventure and quest like this could go completely smoothly from A to B, but it turns out um, that not all of the patterns were in that. Uh, the flies were evidently good enough that the owner um, probably used, and as we all yeah. do, you know, lost a few during the normal course of, uh, it, of fly fishing activities. It has been uh, sort of... Uh, posited hasn't it that uh, perhaps the missing ones were the most successful yeah it's interesting looking at the ones when you when you look at um, Cookless advice for the sorts of patterns that he fished uh, it seems to be some of those some of those come pretty high up uh, on his yeah. kind of favorites list and those yeah. tend to be the ones that are missing so we were you know I was already at the position of realizing that for my own sanity I needed to collate and make sense of a lot of these experiments these experiences on stream the recreation, the research, uh, just for my own benefit and collating that information. But it, it clearly made sense as well that one of the best ways to share that and not just selfishly could keep enjoying it as we have done for the last... Uh, well, I started looking to this, into this probably two years ago hmm. uh, and it's really this last trout season where everything's really come together very, very um, cleanly and sort of you know having some of these great successes by you know the final pieces of the, the puzzle sort of dropping in place. But yeah, having said all that, it, it just became quite obvious that uh, it seemed like a really, really good, strong candidate for it's a good story, some great characters involved, um, putting it together into, into a book. Yeah. The problem is, is that then that commits you to what you do about the missing patterns you know, yeah. do we just accept that gap? There's, I mean, don't get me wrong, the set of photographs that we've got from Stephen Shane and John Shane's brother are fantastic. Um, a br br brilliant just sort of record. And even if that was the only thing um, that we collected in the book, it would be, be amazing. But I mean, there is a gap, there is a hole there. Just stepping back and looking at the book as, you know, um, a punter, let's say, and, and an <laughs> avid fly fisher and fly tire. There are several stories within the book. There's... The story of the man himself, you know, um, there's a bit of a, let's call it a bit of biography mm. um, because he's not widely known or widely written about. He's not, and he didn't really, naturally, he didn't naturally uh, write about himself, particularly in his book, he's writing yeah. about fly fishing. Yeah. So he accidentally reveals a few details, yeah. but, you know, you need to actually go and research yeah. his life separately, yeah. which is, you know, something that... So you get a bit of biography about mm. the man himself. Then there's the actual original manuscript, you know, the, the original tome that... Uh, got things rolling less yeah then there's the collection of flies as tied by roger woolley mm. and there's something about the story about roger woolley as well and this collection of flies but then we came on to the missing flies and that is almost book worthy in itself mm. um paul has been on an <laughs> obsessive <laughs> journey <laughs> what are you saying he's saying i'm some kind of Mildly obsessive character. <laughs> uh, it, it started to worry me at times, particularly when we were driving down the M1 to go and clip <laughs> fur off cows. <laughs> uh, we at least had a stunt double for that. And actually, yeah. massive, massive thanks to uh, Richard Toon and, and Anita as well. Um, just outside Ashbourne, uh, the only vaguely northerly herd of Devonshire red um what they call their uh, red ruby is, is yeah. the name of the breed. These yeah. North Devonshire cattle. Basically, Cutcliffe mentions this this particular colour from a particular part of a particular cow. Yeah, which I might even have in this envelope. Yeah. Um, what do you mean? Obs what do you mean? Uh, obsessive? Yeah. 
it's said to have a slight. It's the the like a, a sort of red game colour, like a red game hackle colour. The cows aren't they? But parts of the fur have this purplish hue to them. Yeah. And we had a, a farmer who breeds bre these cows, <laughs> chasing cows around and bullocks as well. Um, and the prize bull with a pair of scissors trying to chop us a bit of this fur off. There you go, purple um, cow fur or purplish purple yeah, tint. Yeah. Um, but it's fantastic dubbing. Um, that, that's just one part of the story, though. Um, so the, we had we had uh, Robert Minchin from the Tutbury Museum uh, and a, a, a band of, of very helpful volunteers as yeah, well. They opened yeah. up the museum out of season for us, especially. We went uh, there and we just discovered a lot more about Roger Woolley and uh, his background, some fantastic photos yeah. from the um, artefacts there. I've mentioned John Watson. Um, I've got a signed copy of his book um, knocking around as well. Um, for which you know massive thanks and his insights have been invaluable in trying to understand particularly things like bottoming out the, the hook sizing um and the proportions and things like that and, and just there's, fact checking the, the the stuff in Cutcliffe's book as well there's another story there with hook size charts and, yeah and, yeah you know traditional hook sizes it's absolutely fascinating and modern hook sizes are no better in terms of standardization yeah, but yeah. i think we've done a pretty good job at getting that right as well yeah. um what fascinated me and what started to blow my mind when I, when I thought obsession, as if driving down for, you know, samples of cow fur is not enough. <laughs> um, these dying attempts, uh, what are very simple recipes when you boil it down, just a, a few ingredients boiled together. Um, yeah, basically kitchen cupboard spices. Yeah. And again, that's... Tur turmeric, yeah, but both of those turmeric? Both turmeric, both died in the same pot, but you can see that yeah. um, you put in a, a mordant, which is... Um, what, what did these used to be? <laughs> <laughs> they were. This is rabbit, and, and that's uh, hair. Yeah. Um, spectacular, sort of natural but vivid colours yeah. um, from using turmeric. That's, that's but what I was going to say is that the, the recipe is actually lifted straight from Cutcliffe's yeah. book. Uh, but he's not very precise about quantities, so I had to do a bit of um, basement chemistry and sort of yeah. just trying to get the proportions, the boiling times, that kind of thing. So I did that for my own satisfaction, and I'm, I'm pretty stoked at the uh, the results. The great thing, that brings out the value again of John Shainer's collection because I was able to compare those results mm. to the blended dubbings in the existing one. So it's a bit like, um, you know, algebra, trying to find the missing parts of the equation, mm. but comparing to, to existing known values yeah. as well. So that worked out really well. Even, you know, Etsy and crafters and the right kind of hackles for, yeah. for the right sort of shades, that kind of thing. Um, some Let's great not help forget and, um, Rob Smith. Yeah. Because Rob yeah. is as obsessive as you, if not more. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, what Rob does have is a fantastic collection of feathers dating back, you know, to Victorian era and maybe yeah. even before that. Yeah. Where, you know, these birds are now, they're absolutely off the list of things available to tie with. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, well, they're historic and th there's just no way you'd contemplate, you know, trying to source feathers from a thrush, yeah, let's say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, and um, other things as well. That You know, he's, he's got things from personal correspondence with, with hackles of the right era and the right mm -hmm. um, combination of spangled colours and hues and that kind yeah. of thing, which is... So that's one of uh, Rob's very kind donations. I think that may be from the 30s, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but he also... Uh, he has a great sort of um, ex-taxidermy and an old sort of classic taxidermy sort of specimens... There's an unfortunate roadkill, um, Mr. Fox um, patch there that was came through Rob's generosity, essentially. But it, it just means that you have these people out there, and it's fantastic because you get access to this forgotten world, this this kind of what would have been you know day-to-day uh, -day bread and butter materials for somebody in the 1800s. We've had to work quite hard to kind of recreate that. Down to the hooks as well, you know, finding the right sort of the shape and, and proportions of the hooks, combining that with the reading of the manuscript, that's actually allowed us to do, I think, a, a pretty decent job of actually recreating those missing flies. And I've got, I've got the selection of the ones in here to the correct proportions, to the correct treatments um, with, with the finished flies as well. So imagine, <laughs> if you will, all those fantastic flies that Paul recreated faithfully from Cutcliffe's original book.
To the best um, of my abilities, yeah, know, with all the kind of appropriate qualifications. <laughs> if if you're uh, no stranger to our previous publications, you'll know the quality of flight pictures has been fairly good, I would say. Yeah, no, <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, the stuff that you put together for um, Outfield Fish. Maybe. So what we've got is great pictures of the woolly collection of mm. Cuckley flies, which was not complete. Paul's faithful recreations and quite an in-depth analysis of the variations in tying and the, the meaning of things in the recipes. Yeah. Cutcliffe's original book, Cutcliffe's life story, uh, the story of our voyage of discovery on all this. There's a little bit of biography of Roger Woolley in there. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a breakdown of all the technical aspects of Cutcliffe's book because some of the terminology is not what you'd see in modern fly fishing literature. Mm -hmm. So I paused on a bit of a sort of Rosetta Stone chapter <laughs> yeah. to give you all, all the right uh, sort of terminology when, so you'll know what he means when he says it. It's but basically also, a dictionary of terms, yes. of that sort of stuff. But then there's some fantastic, I mean, we can flash a few pictures, but I think mm. some fantastic drawings of the setup, you know, featuring uh, knots, uh, attachment methods, setups. Stuff um, that I mean, if in modern nymphing, you, there's some great things for yeah. droppers. You know, there's just yeah. a great tactic right out of the box there. Yeah. How to prepare the hackles before you tie them. Um, yeah. All of that. You know, there's some diagrams of, of that, yeah. which is it's quite difficult to discern from the written bit. I had to yeah. work really hard to understand what he meant by how he sort of prepared the, the, the hackles um, and that kind of thing. So yeah, that's all diagrammed out as well. Yeah. Um, getting to that correct hook size. You know, we've got the research. We've got the sort of the measuring. Mm. Um, basically everything that you'd need to recreate that experience and start to have some of the same sort of amount of fun that we've been having with using these flies so effectively um, and just enjoying that sort of whole aspect. It, it covers, for example, you know, it covers eyed versions of the flies, which is what mm -hmm. Roger Woolley was concentrating on versus the ones that were dressed as traditional, which was onto the directly onto the tippet as well. Yeah. So you, you can choose how modern or how much of a kind of a, a reenactment, kind of historic sort of recreation you want to go with it. But there's so many things that you can add to your all of your river sort of wet fly fishing. It's got the best of tying. everything, hasn't it? <laughs> if you are tradition so sort of traditionalist in mind that you would dress to tip it. Yeah. Um everything that's in this this book is just fantastic. But if you are only interested in success and modern sort of competition bred methods and, mm. and getting out and catching fish it's equally as good because these are tried and tested methods that were working on trout in, in Devon yeah. um, over 100 like years ago. Like I say, ago. you recognise the mechanics with the yeah. modern nymph thing sort of stuff. Yeah, the, the simple fact is, though, if you put him, you know, set him up with a modern nymph rod, I dare say you'd do a pretty good uh, <laughs> impression of a modern angler as well. Yeah, so the best and uh, slickest um, segue into that is that basically there's people within the Small Streams Mastery Group have already started to pre-order their copies of that the hard copy the extended mm. hard copy compared to the little mini ebook that we started to put together for that mm. they started making those orders already but watch out in the next day or two where we'll basically we'll close off this this episode as the kind of the, the story uh, telling aspect of it and then watch out for a special pre-order offer that you can get in on for the first print run for some signed copies of this book that we've put our, you know heart and soul into um and it's been wonderful and, and just really great fun to do it. But, you know, I really love for people to get the same sort of amount of enjoyment yeah. that we've had out of it already. Yeah. Um, in terms of it, it's a real voyage of discovery. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 100%. Sign up to the notifications for, yeah. uh, well, you get free lessons as well if you're yeah, not already on, on there. It's on screen somewhere around about now. Or under in the description or above, yeah. wherever yeah. it might be. You'll find a link to subscribe. That means you'll be notified when um, this offer comes out when it goes live and what you can do about it. <laughs> yeah. So that's it for this mini series on fishing discoveries. Uh, join us next time. This won't be the last thing we do. Until then, it's goodbye from Paul and it's goodbye from myself.